All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Mindful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel. And today we have Tanner from Frontiersman Gear, a kind of a local uh, success story in the outdoor space. Uh, he's a knife maker who makes some really badass shit. Tanner, thank you very much for taking the time, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. It'll be good to catch up and chat. Yeah, it was kind of funny. This all kind of happened because, well, there's, it happened for two reasons. One, I've been thinking for a while because, you know, now that the podcast has a few listeners, I think it's kind of important to like, we don't have a lot of like homegrown talent, both for like people who make films, like the kind of stuff I do, and then people who make actual gear like you do. So I was like, when you see somebody standing out like you are, I was like, okay, I need to get that guy on the podcast. But then when I read the article by Journal of Mountain Hunting, that got me, you know, really interested as well. So yeah, man, I'm, I'm super excited to have this conversation. Where I'd like to start is just kind of your background. Are you a BC boy born and bred? What's your, what's your deal? Are you originally from here? Or are you a transplant? Um, so I say, I'm, I, I say I'm from BC, like my mom and dad, they lived up in Norman Wells for 25 years. So okay. actually like the start of my childhood was up there. Okay. Um, and then we moved down to Dawson Creek, uh, Northern BC. Yep. And then that's kind of, that's where I call home. Like if people really want to say it. So I spent most of my, most of my coming to adult years in Dawson Creek there. And that's kind of, that's where I cut my teeth hunting. That's where, you know, I've, that's where I would call it home. Um, and then we bounced around and moved everywhere, chasing rigs in the oil field from like uh, Northern Alberta, uh, and then all the way down to like Southern BC, just kind of bounced around after that. And I, I was in the military. So, I mean, you're posted in every God forsaken shithole there is in, in Canada, but I mean, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm a BC boy. I love it here. I've never had any other driver's license or, or hunting license. So I love it here, man. How old are you? Just so we get some context for this. I'm 25. Okay. Wow, man. Yeah. Lots of stuff done already. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was a piece been, of shit at 25. That, no, been, that's not true. I had a little blip between 23 and 27 where I kind of had my shit together and then it all fell apart again. But anyways, we don't need to get into that. So, so tell me about, about hunting. Do you come from a hunting family? How did that whole thing happen? So I come from uh, like more of the sustenance hunting side. So okay. like up in Norman Wells, like it was complete sustenance hunting up For there. people who don't know, because they're not going to understand what that is. Give me some context for Norman Wells. So people understand what that actually <laughs> so, is. Uh, Norman Wells is a small town in Northern Northwest territories. Um, it, it had about 650 people at the time when we lived up there. I think it's down to about 300 people now. Okay. Um, it was basically a, um, a hub for oil activity that was up there at the time. That's what my brought my dad up there. And then the business brought my mom up there as well. And that's where they connected and met. Uh, it's, it's a real remote outpost though. So, I mean, you're talking a barge. Are you fly at, in only? At the time there was uh yeah. So fly in, but the, when you're to really get supplies in, you're either taking a barge when the, when the river opens up, one barge will come through in the summer or else okay. the ice road will open up in the winter. But with weather, you're maybe getting like a two, three week break to try and get the hell out of town to get down to like Edmonton to stock up or something. So okay. it, it's remote living is as uh, pretty much as remote living as you can get without being raid out in the sticks. Yeah. So it was lots of sustenance hunting, uh, lots of caribou, moose, that kind of thing, like enough to feed the freezer or fill the freezer, feed the dogs. Um, and then when we moved to Dawson Creek, uh, didn't fall out of it, but you know, my mom, my mom and dad split. So there wasn't like, my dad wasn't really in the picture. So okay. I kind of drifted away from it till I was probably not that long, like probably till I was 13, 14, picked it up through a neighbor's father and then got back into it. And then it just, it was like, I don't know, like riding a bike where you just, yeah. uh, it bites back in and then you just don't let it go. So I've been hunting steady since I legally could here in BC. Yeah. And what are your, what, what's your current passion around hunting? Like, are, are you more of a generalist? Is there one thing you're looking forward to every year? Um, you know, I, I, up until probably six months ago, I'd say elk. Like okay. uh, that, that was my jam. I mean, that's what I've been yeah. doing. That's what I cut my teeth on was hunting elk. And then, 
Uh, it's what I've loved to do and harvested lots of elk. I've been pretty lucky with that. But in the last, I don't know, six months, eight months, it's really been, I just want to, like, we have so much stupid opportunity here in BC that is just, I'm, I just feel like, I'm, uh, and I'm young, but I still feel like, oh, every year that goes by, I'm like, oh, I'm wasting it. Like, I need to see something different. So yeah. that's a whole jam for me now is just different species, different areas, even all kinds of different, like, just keep it different every year. Yeah, I feel like I, I, I that resonates with me because, like, for me, I was obsessed with elk primarily because I was really shitty at hunting them. Um, like it took me five years and seven hunts to get my first elk. Um, and I did take it with a bow solo. So it's like, I feel like at least when I got it done, it was like a pretty badass way to get yeah. it done. But I also felt like because of where the elk rut fell, it kind of nuked a whole lot of other opportunity because I couldn't be gone from home for so long. And I looked back and I'm like, man, over the last few years, like all I've really done is maybe some like spring bear and elk hunting. And then once I took my elk, I kind of felt like there was a bit of weight off my shoulders. I was like, mm -hmm. I still love elk. If you put a gun to my head and said I could only help one thing for the rest of my life, I'd probably say elk with the bow just because of like how engaging it is and the vocalizations and the back and forth. Like, yeah. But in the same breath, it's enabled me to kind of branch out. And I did my first sheep hunt next year. And I can already tell, like, that's going to be my next white whale. Like, I'm like, I can't stop thinking. Yeah. And I think until I'm successful and I'm willing to, you know, who knows, man, it might be two years, it might be 10 years. I don't know. But I do know now that that will be the thing around which my season revolves until I'm able to, like, put that notch on the belt. And then, I'll, and then who knows? I'll, I'll try and do something else. But I like, I like your attitude, especially with the opportunity and there's long seasons, man. Like if you start taking in bear and you start taking in that late white tail season and that early sh sheep season, like if you're strategic about your time away from home and your time away from your business, like you can fit in a couple, three like badass hunts or even where you are, you have shitload of good day hunting mm -hmm. opportunity as well. So that really opens the floodgates. Yeah. And like, that's, that was my other thing is now with re running the business that I do having to spread it out, it means I can't just focus on elk, like how I used to do it. Like I would basically, I, I dropped out of school young and then I would basically work all the winter, not have any weekends off, no days off, you're moving rigs. And then I would take all my holidays in September and I'd take basically the last week of August till the first week of October. And I, you wouldn't see me, I would just be out in the bush hunting elk. Right. So yeah it's changed now, which means I need to change with it. And that means uh, a variety of areas, like you said, species, but exactly like you said, I could do, you know, for the, fr I could do a, a two week hunt every quarter of the yeah. year and be hunting a different species, different area yep. and have a super cool, successful, opp op successful opportunities and, and a cool hunt every time. I know you and Nick are buddies, but listening to your story reminds me of Nick's story a lot, like the way he got super obsessed with the rigs. And then by doing that, that was able to kind of leapfrog him into like his next passion. But he was the same guy who was just like, he just worked himself to the bone over a period of time. But, yeah. but having that kind of discipline is what enabled him to kind of jump off into what has turned into an extremely successful photography career. Definitely. And like, that was the thing that I found is um, the oil feels so turbulent with how successful it is. And, you know, yeah. the big slumps, the big <clears throat> comeback. And so when I got out, of, I went from moving rigs to the army, I did a uh, term with the infantry. And then when I got released, when I got out, I, you know, I went back to the rigs and didn't love that turbulence again. And it ended up bouncing around, worked for the railroad and all kinds of weird shit. And, uh, so it's nice now kind of same position Nick's in or, you know, anybody that's starting to contract for themselves or work for their own business where it's like, you hope at least it's half fast steady to where I, now I can be like, yeah, I, I can book this four months out or I can book yeah. a hunt five, five months away and not be like a week before. And all oh, of this job came up here, you know, you can't go anymore. Yeah. hundred percent. And I, I th think it's, it's funny about your passions too, because I think a lot of people get passionate about the outdoor space and figure out how to work in it. And I'm always a little bit hesitant to recommend that to people. I've been fortunate enough and I come from a forestry background. So when you talk about the turbulence of the oil fields, I, I feel you like 2008 hit like a fucking sledgehammer. I ended up moving from Holberg on the Island up to Quinnell. Like I used to bounce and I do layout. So I was an engineer. Um, 
so you used to bounce all over the place just trying to follow the the timber. And I've been lucky enough now to transition into, you know, consulting, which and I have a pretty lucrative career. But sometimes I'm like, you might want to just focus on finding something that like you make some decent money at because that is another way to pursue your passions. And I'm not saying do something that you hate. Like clearly the rigs kind of took their toll on you and you realize it's clearly not something you want to do for the rest of your life. But I think, and it's funny, you're you're younger, but you're talking like an older guy because that's some of the younger guys I talk to just want to jump straight into that doing the thing that I love to do. And they don't realize that there might be that step of doing some shit you don't want to do in order to kind of create an environment or fund yourself to go do that thing that you love to do. And that's a lot easier to do when you got some cash in the bank than when you're fucking broke. Definitely. And like, I mean, uh, I've been lucky enough to watch some people that have came, come into it. And the, the guys that do try and chase it to be inside of the industry it seems like the industry ruins hunting for them. Like yes. it really does when you start yes. laying everything and you're like reliant on a hunt or the success of it or any of that to be financially successful, it's yeah. going to ruin it for you. Like there's no way around it. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Unless, yeah. Unless you have that external, like get that external job that can fund it and then just make sure you have good time off or work it. You know, like I said, I worked all winter so I could have the summers off. Yeah. I don't care. Like, it's all about the future stuff, not the, not the current. Right. Yeah. I think that's a great message to pass on. So when did the knife stuff kind of come into your life? Is this something that you did earlier on or like, how did you, cause like to me, the barrier entry is like pretty high, man. Like I wouldn't even have the first <laughs> notion about how to go making your knife or even imagining the type of gear you would need to do that for the first time. So <laughs> the, one of our neighbors up in Norman Wells uh, was conservation officer and a knife maker for like 30 years, 35 years at the time. Uh, my mom and dad moved down to Dawson Creek and ends up that they're living down the road. Like just by happenstance, they have a farm down the road, these neighbors. So we end up going over there. I think I was maybe 10 at this point and make a knife in his shop again. He's still doing it, everything like that. He's retired now. So he's doing knives full, full time, make another knife and super cool use it hunting you know kind of a piece of shit but you know <laughs> but you made it through. so it's your yeah. piece of shit exactly and i always thought it was cool and then it kind of it kind of was like hunting for me where it drifted away kind of and i was a young kid you know like big trucks and chasing girls and moving rigs and stuff like that and forgot about the knife making side um fast forward i get out of the infantry i go down to cam loops and my mom's like oh you should go visit ken this this knife maker, he lives down there in Kamloops now. So I'm like, oh, cool. So we, so we swing down there and, you know, <laughs> it took, uh, by the time I, we hit the bo bottle of, uh, bottom of a bottle of whiskey, I convinced him to do like an apprenticeship for me because okay. I'd asked, I had asked him, like, he has no kids. He had never taught anybody before. And I was like, okay, so you've been doing this 35 years. The knowledge that you've gained in 35 years, where are you passing this down to? Like, yeah. you don't have a son. You die with you, man. Never taught anybody. And he goes, yeah, I guess nobody. And I was like, okay, well, would you do an apprenticeship? And he said, no. And then that's when we started, you know, <laughs> dabbling into the whiskey. And by the end of it, he was like, okay, yeah, if you, it's going to be a long program and I'm going to set it up over weekends, but you got to come out here every single weekend. I was like, okay. So we're living in Kamloops. He's out in Ashcroft. It's an hour and a half drive. I'm like, okay, we'll make it work. Right. Well, eight and a half months later before he signs off on me, I'm like, holy shit, I haven't a weekend in eight and a half months, but he signs off on me. Uh, and what does that look like in the knife world when you, when you say he signed, cause I know how like the trade systems work, you'd end up with like a red seal, but what does that yeah. look like in the knife world? So, uh, more down in the States, they have an actual system at, uh, an actual system that goes into it. So they call it the ABS, uh, bladesmith. So you, okay. you start as a journeyman or you start as apprentice and you do, Get, then you pass a test to become your journeyman by making knives and a board of people test it and this and that. But up here in Canada, we don't really have that. Okay. So uh, a lot of knife making is a real uh, family tree of where like Ken had certain guys that he learned with and those guys each taught somebody. And that's kind of their praise is like, I can look at somebody's knife and be like, oh, he either learned from this person or this person. No shit. It eh? has like, a it's like it's got a fingerprint on it. Exactly. So like, and it's kind of 
like you can tell when there's a new knife maker that hits the board, they they have less credibility because there's there's not this like lineage of who did you learn from. Right. So that's the big thing is that for him to put his name on to me where I can say, yeah, Ken John was the guy I learned from. Um, he's like, it has to be up to this standard. And he was super strict about it, which worked well for me because that's what I need. But yeah. yeah, worked really good. That's badass, man. That's cool. So, yeah. so when was that? Give me a timeline on that. Uh, that would have been, that would have been four, four years ago. Okay. And yeah. so, and so, so then what, is this now just something cool that you've got, or do you right away decide like, this is what I want to do for a living. And not only that, I want to, I want to have my own thing. <laughs> I've, I've always been like, even as a kid, I was making bird houses to try and, you know, oh, I'm going to have my own business. I'll Very entrepreneurial. Like I've always been like, I've always, I've liked selling stuff, making my own stuff. So as yeah. soon as I got that, and to be honest, I, I like to be my own boss. I'm not, yeah. I don't do great with leadership. So, um, and I like being very good at things. Like, I like, I like having goals, being successful, getting them done and that kind of thing, which I mean, works good for if you're your own, your own boss. So yeah. I, immediately I was like, okay, I need to make a business plan. I need to figure out how this works. And uh, kind of just made a business plan, started going after the knife making thing. And then I basically just tapered whatever job I was doing at the time. So for a while it was railroad and then it was construction just slowly start tapering that off where it was like, okay, now I'm going to work four days a week and have two days a week in the shop, uh, like making knives. And then I'm going to have three days a week and, and then three. And days did you have to build your own knives. shop at this time? And what's a shop look like? Like what are your, what are your <laughs> so, bare essentials for knife making? It, in cam loops, it started as uh, <laughs> a, a work table under our deck, okay. which not waterproof, like just a shit show. Right. But uh, basically the biggest thing you need is like a, a belt grinder. So, um, went on YouTube and ended up building a handmade one out of an old, old, uh, treadmill motor and no rigged shit. it all up. And <laughs> it reminds uh, me of some I tattoos still... that I got with a Walkman <laughs> motor and Bic pen ink. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty redneck, but, uh, I actually still have it it's here somewhere, but, um, got it rigged up. So you basically just need that. And then a lot of hand tools. And as, as you progress, like, I mean, I've got a full shop now of, you know, machines that cover every angle and part of a knife to make you more efficient. But um, really that belt grinder is the big barrier to entry. Once you have that, you're pretty good. So I I had had that homemade grinder on a bench outside under a deck and just worked off of that. And it it just, it blossomed really fast. Um, And do you have a partner at this point? Are you married? Uh, yeah, so I've been, I, I'm not married. I've been with Kennedy for uh, five years now. Okay, so um, she's with you through this whole thing. Yeah, it, okay. from the beginning. So okay. basically, as soon as I got out of the military, I met Kennedy, like as soon as I got out. So um, yeah, so uh, I I was lucky enough to have a really good connections from working all over, whether all the crate, like freaking, I've probably had 30 jobs in my life. So I, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of connections and basically, we just started getting my name out there, just cold calling people, seeing if they like knives or if they wanted to buy knives and just started getting customer base in place. And then the big thing I have to praise about all of it was social media, just, right. you know, getting your name out there and learning about how social media works and all that. I had no idea about it and just kind of took off from there. Like, I mean, it was, it was pretty gradual to begin with. And then so what type of point. knives are you making at first? Like what are the first two or three knives you're actually getting uh, paid to make. They, they were custom knives, so you know, like kind of drop point hunters. Yeah. Person sends me a drawing of what they want, and I, I'm putting at that point, I'm putting it together that way. And at that point, like one knife over, you know, weekends and this and that was taking me like two months to make. Right. It was just like slowly piecing it together here and there, um, and then basically just. It, it developed into what it is now. I don't, sometimes I just blink. I don't even realize where, how it got to this point, but it was just, yeah, just slowly putting more time into it and taking less time away from my, my own job until, until I start doing this full time. And so what does business look like today? Like, give me a sense of scale. Is most of it done through a website where people order online and you've got like a certain list of things that they can order and, and like how many knives? Cause that's the difference like, do you still say you're a full custom custom shop or would you be like a blended custom shop where 
elements of each knife are customized, but other elements aren't like what that was a whole bunch of questions in a row, but kind of talk about that so, a little bit. Um, de- definitely still consider myself completely, a completely custom knife okay. maker. Um, l- last year, like we'll just look back at 2021. I, d- I did about 80 custom knives. I was okay. plotted to do about 120, but with delays and different stuff that we had in the chaos for last year, it slowed it down. And then, so I have a, a custom side and then a semi-production side. So my ultralights and some new models that we're going to be launching there. And off that side, I did about another 400 blades. The ultralight side, I did about 400 blades through that. Okay. So to order a knife, the all the semi-production stuff, there's still little customization options like handle color, engraving on a blade, let's say. And that's all done through drops on the website. So you watch on social media or you're on the email list. I say when the blades are going to drop, I drop 50 knives. And then when they sell out, they sell out on the website. I love it. And then the, yeah. And then the custom side, uh, if you go to my website, there's a blade order form. So uh, either people reach out through social media, meet them in person, phone me, email, and they'll say, hey, look, I want to order a custom knife. I direct them to the website or they just find the website and fill the form out. And it basically, it, it covers a lot of the little questions that just to get out of the way, not wasting either, either our times, like everything from pin color on the knife to um, what's what kind color? of like uh, the pins that go through the handle to, okay. to connect the handle material on either side. Yep. So pick that pin color, the material, uh, like what kind of finish do you like on the knife? Maybe a mirror polish, a satin finish. Um, there's select knife shapes that I've kind of have a, a rotating stock of uh already cut out and they can say yeah i I like that but i just want to customize the handle where or maybe there's some people that are like you know i i want completely custom we're going to spend some time on the phone i'm going to sketch stuff out for you i'm going to send you pictures of it you're going to say no change this change that i like this different so i mean it it still is fully custom on that side of it if you're going towards a custom knife uh, i really i i kind of put my stamp on being a completely custom shop on that side. And what's like the price range of a, of a custom knife. And I'm, I'm sure it's like quite wide depending on mm-hmm. what people ask for and what kind of things influence that. Is it like material selection? Is it complexity of structure? Like we talk about that a little yeah. bit. So, um, yeah, my custom knife price, like just, <laughs> just, a, just a starting note on it. Um, there's so many hours that go into custom knives that yeah. when you're doing it full time, it's super expensive, especially like I'm never going to put out a product that's half ass. It's always going to be the, whatever the best is I can do on it. So there's the price of custom knives can be pretty astronomical for uh, like full-time makers like myself or people that are super skilled down in the States, more of it, like really artistic guys. Um they're selling knives in the three, $4,000 range. That's nothing abnormal down there. Yep. Uh, for my, for myself, uh, ba- a base custom caper is going to be in that five fifty, six hundred dollars $600 range. Okay. And then a normal hunter, you're going to get up into that eight, $900 range. Chef knives are going to be in the 1100 to $1,200 range. And then it, it really flows from there. We can get into museum pieces. I have a couple on the books right now and they're, they're over 3000 bucks a piece. Wow. So it's, so it's really, um, that's about what I would think, man, the, the other numbers for the more like, you know, run of the, not, I want to say run of the mill, but the type of knives that I would expect, like that's definitely in line with what I would expect. Like just knowing what I do know about the craft, I don't see how you could, you know, make it any cheaper without spending yeah. less time <laughs> or shortcutting some of the process. And then it's not really like that true custom piece that kind of makes it what it is. Definitely. And, and- no, I appreciate that. And and a lot of it is like the, the time that I put into it. Uh, but a bigger portion of it is I really pride myself on using the best materials possible. So whether it's muskox horn or dull sheep horn or exotic woods from like true stabilized exotic woods from around the world or narw- narwhal tusk, mammoth ivory, whatever it is, I'm using, I really try and use the best stuff possible, which means there's a huge price tag with it. Yeah. There's, you know, if, if a person wants like a hunter and rosewood burl block of wood on their handle, a hidden tang, let's say like a, a hunter style knife, it's going to use that whole block of wood, that block of wood, just for me to get it is going to be about 200 us bucks. No shit. So, I mean, I need to reflect that cost back on a customer. Right. And yeah. that's, 
we haven't even got to start. Like I haven't even touched a grinder yet and right. you're two, 200 bucks in us. Right. So, um, material is a huge one that, that plays with the costs. The other one is any artistic stuff that you get into. If you start layering materials or having, um, you know, inlays and stuff like that into it, it can eat up time really quick. So, I mean, that makes, I'm a little bit familiar with this because like I, I wanted, um, you know, for my podcast room, you can't see it, but this table is this like this, this, these guys made me this fur table, but I was originally looking at like a slab and you probably know what that market is like, like just getting a slab. Yeah. And it's like, you see the black walnut and then you actually start looking at some of that and you're like, holy shit, man. Like, like for, for an unfinished hunk of wood, you want like multiple thousands of dollars, you know, like it hasn't even been made and it doesn't even have fucking legs on it. It's not anything. (laughs) And so, yeah, I get it, man. I was, I was shocked, especially in, cause in that space, you know, you're looking for big continuous, contiguous hunks as well, which makes things really difficult and, and really pricey. So I can just imagine, especially the cool, more artistic, artisanal like pieces I'm sure because people have to source all that stuff and then finish it and do all that stuff. So definitely. So talk to me. Well, before we get into that, actually, what would you say your style is? Like, what's your unique perspective on on knife making? Or like you were said earlier, if you see what somebody makes, you would be able to tell who it was. What is he, what do people see when they look at your knives that let them know that this is a frontiersman gear piece? Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Like, I mean, uh, my whole motto now for like custom knives is I want to make uh, functional art is okay. really where it is. I, I want something that's going to last for generations to be passed on, like truly not just to your kids, but your kids, kids. Um, but at the same time, it, it has no excuse to be ugly. It, it's, right. it, it's like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> guys use those two calling cards and it's like oh well, I, I make art or else it, it, i make something that's super durable but it's not very often that they both blend together so that's that's my big thing is i try and make functional art the best way that i can and uh, as for like a style it's it, it, it's tough to say like there's little things in the grinding of the knife and in the shaping of the handle and stuff like that that i, I can look at that, that a guy that really knows knives can look at it and be like, oh yeah, that's one of Tanner's pieces because right. it's just little things like that. It'd be pr- pretty hard to explain on here, but like just angles, angles and kind of even the flow or the shape to the knife. Okay. Um, yeah, it, there's, <laughs> I can't really put it on one thing I'm trying to think of, but. No, it's all good, man. I really liked that, the workable art, the functional art. And the kind of blending of of those two things, like that, to me is like your unique kind of point of differentiation. I really, I, I want to, I want to buy a knife now. <laughs> I, that's the kind of shit I get off on. Like, I like being a connoisseur of things. Like, I'm serious about my coffee. Like, I, if I'm gonna do something, I want it to be. I'm serious about my gear. I learned very early on in whatever I do. If I just buy the best, I never regret it. And also, like, value retains value. When you buy something of quality, it remains quality for a long period of time. And that might be camera gear, that might be your tent for hunting, but like, and then if you do decide, you know, you want out of it or you want to try something different, that really high-end shit retains its value, man. Like, I think I'm on like seventh or eighth camera in the last 20 years. And normally I get like 70 or 80% of the sticker price because I was willing to buy that really nice thing. So I think it's more of like a mindset. Like when you can appreciate quality, you kind of appreciate it across the board. And I, I personally, yeah. that's how I feel about stuff. And you have pride I'll, in it I'll, too. You know what I mean? Like definitely. And I, I'm the same way. Like I'll, I hate buying junk. Yeah. I have, I pride myself in having like a nice truck. It's clean. Yep. All my shit's clean. All my shit's nice. I take care of it. It takes care of me in the mountains or with whatever I want it to do. So uh, I'm definitely on the same, same wave like this you on that, man. And the other thing that I try and like, um, not like whatever, not to sell people on my knives, but the cool aspect I have and where I'm lucky with all this is I was a hunter first before I started making knives. Right. So like I really service outdoor industry because 
um, I, I feel lucky that I can come at it as a hunter and say, I know a night a guy's not going to sit there and hold a knife like this while he's cutting an animal, right? Yeah. At no point are you holding a knife like that and fucking trying to cut an animal up. Yeah. You're holding it in different ways or different angles. I was watching a movie the other like day that. and they like literally gutted a deer. Like, and I'm like, <laughs> get the fuck out of here. You're telling me you don't got one guy on that set? That's killed a deer and can speak up and be like, what are you assholes doing? Like nobody yeah. in the history of time has ever like, like stabbed a deer. Rammed like he just got guts spilling out everywhere. And, and then he just starts sawing upwards. And I'm just like, and it was like a credible show. Like everything yeah. about the show was like pure, like top end Hollywood. And then they're just like, and I'm just like, like, I'm lo- I'm like, I can't even watch this now. Like you were just assholes. Like, so yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. And I think yeah, that's, so I and, like that. And that was the part that really spoke to me from the Journal of Mountain Hunting article as well, was that you didn't you, you wanted to put out pieces that were of a certain caliber, and you were willing to have the patience and 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 put in the time to make sure they were of that caliber before they got released. Like I think the companies that I stand behind the most, probably some of them have like a two to four year product runway. Like it's going to take like, you know, 12 to 18 months to design something. And then they're going to put it out for maybe another 12 to 18 months. And then they're going to have to do all the back end work before they actually release it. And then when you get it, it's like, this is a thoughtful product that people put time and energy into. And it was appropriately tested, like talking about the stuff that Nolan and Nick and like those dudes are legit. Like you're going to have a hard time finding guys who spend more time in the field and use their knives on more animals than those guys. Well, and that that's the biggest thing. And that's what I've seen in the last year, especially is like these products, not just around knives, especially in knives, but you know, um, on the other side of the gear side, like so many companies are, are using their customer base to test their equipment yes. on and it's bullshit. It, it, it nothing infuriates me more. I think it's yep. a complete disregard of your customer, and it's you're disrespecting a customer is all you're doing. Because like yeah. I've tried to say it before, like I, I grew up working, I grew up like lower middle class. I understand what the dollar's worth, and I don't want somebody wasting my time or my money me testing their shit out. So yep. I don't expect that from anybody else out of my stuff. So anything that I'm putting out, I want to make sure that it is the cream of the crop, make sure like if there's any changes I have to make, they're super micro and they're not actually changing anything in the performance of a product. Yeah. No, I love it. Okay. So let's get into a bit of a materials conversation. Cause I got a ton of, I got a ton of, um, questions about this that I'm sure we'll get into if we don't nail it all right now, but maybe just give me an intro on knife steel. And then, cause I, I understand there's like a range. I understand that you can be too soft. And I also also understand that you can be too hard. Like I shoot iron wheel broadheads and they're a tool steel that actually presents some complications that you wouldn't think it does. Um, Mm -hmm. um, so maybe just talk to me a little bit about, about this, you know, some of the steels that are involved in knife making and then why you make the decisions you do in regards to which type of metals you choose to use. Yeah. So, um, for knife steels, there definitely is a a nice midpoint there. Um, what you can do is when you're playing with the hardness of a steel. Um, so, so they, they record on the Rockwell scale is what they call it. Okay. So all of my knives are trying to settle right in that 60 to 61 spot. Okay. Um, at at 60 to 61, regardless of what this steel is, you're going to have a, a knife steel that, you're kind of optimizing edge retention with um, kind of field sharpening and maintainability. So, and you're not getting a really brittle edge or anything else that goes along with that. Quickly to go down that, like for our flaying knives, I'll bring it down a hair. So I'll bring it down to like that 59 because I want to have some of that flex to it. I want to make sure that edge isn't super brittle and I can give up a little bit of edge retention knowing that fish are pretty soft in the flesh and you know, guys don't care about sharpening it a little bit more to make sure their knife doesn't snap out in the field. Right. Whereas like a chopping knife, a competition chopper where they're doing these big knife events, you'll bring it up to like 64, 65, and you'll just have this 
board of a knife that's you know the edge will never go away on it but if you try and flex that thing it's going to crack and snap okay um for my for myself i, I test new seals every year <clears throat> the it's always a balance in price obviously because sure. you could pay out the ass and steel the- must be i'm assuming with like some of the complications overseas steel's just got to be a shit show right now oh absolutely like i mean um like to get so i, I like nitro v it's um all these steels when you're looking at like they call it in quotation marks like super steels the stainless steels that uh, are high performance or or made to be for for knives they're all fluctuating different amounts of chromium and uh, vanadium and all these different they're adding but it's all like you know 0.50 percent or two okay. percent here and they're just playing a little bit here and there to try and all these different steel manufacturers to try and see what works best in different situations so um tested a lot of steels i love nitro v it's a super stain re- resistant steel so stain less doesn't mean it won't rust it's yep. just stain less not stain proof so uh it's it's super rust resistant uh stain resistant it, but the nice thing is is it's super um you, you can maintain in the field with just a small stone and like a leather strop like strop on your belt or even the canvas on your pack you can i can strop a knife and get it back to hair popping sharp in no time at all um it's it still has a really nice edge retention um you're not really giving up a whole lot there maybe a little bit but i mean when it's maintainable in the field i really feel like that doesn't matter um and to go with that, like if you look at like a classic, like an um, like a high, a really edge retention base steel, like an S ninety V, which is um, um, a steel that it, it's one of the highest performers because of the hardness in the edge due to the edge retention. Where I could process a whole, like I could do probably three quarters of an elk with it and not have to touch a knife up, maybe even a whole elk if I'm really careful. But you will never sharpen that thing in the field, like right. I. I'm a knife maker and I couldn't do it. Like I need to go home. I need to have stones. I need to have like all the equipment to get it sharp again. And to me, that's just, it's not my jam. That's the thing with my, with my iron wheel broadheads. And they've got a couple, like, like some of those ceramic ones where you can like put an edge back on it temporarily, but you're not, and I'm not, I don't fully understand this, but you're kind of taking a shortcut. And, and you're not really sharpening it the way that it's supposed to be sharpened, but those things, and that's one of my issues with them. I, I, and we're going to get into this in a moment. Like I am shit at, at sharpening knives. And it's just one of those things where, to be honest with you, I haven't taken the time to appreciate it and to like learn, learn how to do it the way that it's, that it's supposed to be done. So maybe that's a next, a good segue. Cause I guess the philosophy being, it's good to have a firm edge but not too firm because then at least you can bring it back while you're, while you're out in the field. So maybe talk about sharpening a little bit. Cause there also seems to be this difference of like a more fulsome sharpening that you would do back at home at maybe the beginning of the season or mm-hmm. before you leave on that two week backcountry trip as compared to like, I'm halfway through my elk and I'm just trying to put the edge back on it to finish this kind of thing. How you know, maybe just in general, talk to me about, about sharpening and how we should be looking at that. So um, what I do in the field to maintain an edge, a, a person could run that forever. If they never chipped a knife, they never did any real damage to it, uh, which just being careful with it. Uh, I, I could sharpen like that. And it's great. There's no problem with that. When a person really needs to relook at like doing a full edge set, um, which is bringing that whole edge down. So as you're sharpening a knife, um, basically you're pulling material off the one side of your edge. That's the cutting edge and you're folding it over onto the other and you're creating what's called a burr. So it's a little hook that holds over the side and then um, you're pulling material off the one side. And then you, when you go to sharpen the other side, you're folding that hook back over to roll over onto the other side as you pull material off of the opposite cutting edge. Okay. As, as you use like a heavier grit sharpening. So let's just say at home, myself as a knife maker, I'm using like wet stones. So it's traditional wet stones on a plank and I'm sharpening it just by hand. Um, I'm going to, and then as you lower the grit, you're taking this burr, this piece of material that's hooked over and you're folding it back and forth as I'm raising the grit progression. 
up to 120, then uh, then 240, and I'm just going back and forth, back and forth until it's just this really thin piece of uh, metal that you've slowly been pulling off of each side, and uh, and then you remove it by stropping the edge or running it on a buffer or something like that. Now, that only ever has to get done once if you take care of a knife. Okay. If I'm using a knife out in the field and maybe I cut like an elk bone or I have to go through the brisket of a deer or I don't notice and I'm, you know, I'm pulling against some hide and I swing and I hit a rock and you get a chip out of an edge, then you're going to want to take that whole edge down by having a knife sharpener, um, like a knife maker like myself or somebody that knows sharpening to bring that whole edge down to bring it parallel and get rid of that chip. But when you're in the field and you're just maintaining a knife's edge, um, basically what you're doing is you're taking that, the pinnacle, the point of that, that edge, and all you've done is you've just started to work it. And as it's getting worn down, it's taking all those little serrations and it's folding them over to one side. So by sharpening it in the field, a, a small wet stone or a, a small, sorry, a small ceramic stone, like yeah. work sharp makes them. Yeah. I've got one of those. It's like white on one side and then they've got the, the kind of metal looking thing on the, on the other. other side. Right. Yeah. So that's exactly what I use. So, I never touch the metal side, always just that ceramic rod. And all you're doing is you're just trying to realign those the little micro, like if you look at it at a microscope, all those little serrations and you're just trying to get them back in line again. So you're just, what I'll do is basically, um, like if I shoot an elk, let's say, I'll set a timer on my phone for 45 minutes. So in 45 no minutes... Yeah, because I'm going to forget to drink water. I'm going to forget to eat. I'm going to forget to stop. I, I go I television. Love it, bro. I love I love I look it. at it and I just, I'll go like, uh, like that last bowl I shot solo. Like I was like, I finished off two hours later. My legs are cramping up. I'm pouring. Your lower sweat. back is just and seized, just, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I'm like working a butter knife at this point. I'm just yeah. like, Oh my God. I, I'm just like, I woke up from a blackout. Right. I'm like, yeah. what the fuck just happened? <laughs> um, so I'll set a timer on my phone, 45 minutes In 45 minutes. I have water, have a snack, whatever stretch and uh, and then i'll just touch it onto that stone a couple times so i'm just taking a couple swipes off each side of that ceramic stone on each side of the edge and then i wear a leather belt in the field and i just swipe it backwards a couple times on a leather belt and that's enough to keep that edge hair popping sharp okay um for deer or anything like that you don't have to do it if you have a good knife you shouldn't have to do it very often like i can do a whole deer with my knife and there's not going to be a problem with it an elk i'll usually touch up once maybe twice if i'm doing some caping um i just try and like really push people because i hear it all the time guys are like oh well i can get i can do a whole elk with my knife i don't have to sharpen it and it's like well yeah but by slowly maintaining it and sharpening it it's going to be safer like a sharp knife is a very safe knife because yeah. you're not pulling totally and tugging against yep. the hide um just keep it keep it sharp nobody's ever in a rush i don't care if it's like if it's 10 o'clock at night and you're doing this in the dark, I always hear that. Well, I'm in the dark. I was in a rush. You should not be in the rush. If you're in the dark, you should now slow yourself down at that point. At that point, you're already in the dark. It doesn't fucking matter. You're going to be packing out in the night. Anyways. Every little Nick I've ever done on myself too, has been me just trying to go too fast and like not think exactly. that I could go through so, something and poke my finger. To, well, you know, touch wood. I've never had like a yeah. catastrophe, but it's always, it's, it's never been when I'm like being slow and methodical. About, yeah. about so keep your knife sharp in the field i don't care who you are i hope you carry a knife sharpener even if you're a real placeable blade guy which isn't my jam but even if you are one of those guys you you can touch those edges up too and it, and if that replaceable is starting to get a little bit dull maybe just touch it to a stone once or twice and right. just keep it sharp slow yourself down in the field and i don't care who you are carry a fucking knife sharpener in the bush because it will save your life I, I feel strongly about it. So I have been, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to draw an analogy between mechanical broadheads and fixed broadheads and disposable knives and um, permanent knives. Because when I first started getting into archery, I couldn't tune my bow to shoot fixed points, field points, and broadheads at the same spot. And the solution to that is to shoot mechanical broadheads because mechanical <laughs> broadheads have the surface area of a field point. So they don't exacerbate those like little imperfections in your, in your bow tune. So it's kind of like an idiot's version of bow tuning, but then I bought my own bow press. 
I kind of got super obsessive about, you know, paper tuning and walk back tuning and all, French tuning and all this other stuff. And now my, I can get any broadhead on the planet to hit with my field points out to 60, no problems. Um, and now I shoot fixed blade broadheads because in my opinion, they're the superior, you are, they, they produce less likelihood of failure. Like they are the more reliable option than a mechanical. I'm not going to say, say a mechanical mm-hmm. won't kill when you put it in the right spot, but I think there's, there's a greater opportunity that you're going to, something in the system is going to fail with a mechanical. And I almost feel like disposable is the same way. They're kind of like the dummies version. Cause it's like, as long as you just have one, like I've got, I've had a Havilon Piranha for five years. As long as I got a half a dozen blades in my kill kit, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be fine, but maybe talk about, and it's, you know, it's okay if it's even just opinion, but why do you prefer a, um, a, a permanent blade or like a, like a full blown knife to disposables? Well, I think there's uh there's a few points for me, like the, the, the first one, which is like the easiest one to touch on is um, we put ourselves in a lot of situations as, as backcountry hunters, even if you're truck hunting or whatever it is that you could cut, cut yourself in a really bad situation really fast. Yep. Like um, let's just talk about BC here. And once you're hunting anywhere in the big game season, you're in September, October, weather can blow in fast. Something can happen. You can get lost. Yep. I don't care who you are. There's People bears are lost everywhere. In the bush all the times. Bears everywhere. You, there's a lot of situations where you might need that knife for like a legitimate survival situation to make a shelter or to, you know, who knows what could happen. And at no point is that flimsy little replaceable um, blade going to help you in the bush other right. than cutting meat. Right. And I, I get it. A, a lot of people, oh, I've never been in a situation like that in 20 years in the bush. It's like, well, yeah, but that one situation that you do get into, you're going to really want it. Right. Same thing with your first aid kit. I don't, I, I've never touched my first aid kit. I make it, I check it every year. I haven't, I've never touched it before. It's for some blisters. Know, that's the only reason. Some, <laughs> some Lugo tape it, to put on my feet. That's about the only thing that ever, that ever comes out of it. Yeah. But I know if I ever need to get in there and use that tourniquet, yeah. then it, it's it's fucking there when I need it, right? Yeah. Um, and then outside of that, like, I mean, there's a lot of different things. The, the thing that I would ask is, so you carry, let's say, six replaceable blades yeah. uh, with, with you into the field. Um, uh, why do you carry replaceable blade knives? Yeah, I'm just going to say because it was the easier option and it was the cheaper option. Although I'm willing to admit that it might've been like cheaper up front, but if we follow it, you know, as long as you don't lose it, you're going to have a knife that I buy from you for the the rest of my hunting career. And if you add up, you know, 30 years worth of replaceable blades, it's probably actually not cheaper, but it was probably because I was following Aaron Snyder and he told me to do it. (laughs) And and when I first started hunting, I just did whatever the fuck he said. Uh, So that would have been- Lord and Savior. Yeah, Yeah. uh, that would have been reason number one because somebody who, and I think that's actually a legitimate answer because sometimes we just have mentors and sometimes we just do stuff because the person we were following, that's what they did. So I think that was part of it for sure. Absolutely. Um, Number two, I'm shit at sharpening knives. And I think maybe for 2022, this is going to be one of my goals, like one of the skills I want to add to my, add to my set. Um, and it was, there was this kind of like, I don't know, like weird confidence. Like I've got a couple extra blades. It's really sharp. I'm pretty good at, I'll, I'll say that. Like I'm quite good at using that system where like you don't have like a big blade and you're not worried about Mm -hmm you know, I'm caping with these parts and popping bones with these parts. Like it's just the one kind of piece you're, you're using and they are pretty good. And when I bought my Havilon Piranha, they were kind of it in the disposable game. And just to have for that fine work, it was really nice to have a small knife that you Mm -hmm. could get in little places. But I mean, lots of that arguments kind of moot at this point because you know, Iron Wills comes out with theirs. You've come out with yours. Like there, you, you, that form factor is now available in a more long-term knife. But I would just say never having to sharpen a knife because the first knife I actually bought, do you remember, it was called like the Outbound or the, it was Blaze Orange and it had a button in the middle and you could spin it. 
Oh yeah. And yeah one side was a gut it, yeah. hook and the other side yeah. was like a, a skinning blade. And that was the first knife yeah. I ever bought. And I think I got halfway through a deer and it was like a piece of shit. Oh. And it was like, I wasn't yeah. able to put an edge back on it. I might not even have had, you know what I probably did have, if I remember now, it was a little pull through sharpener. Like one of those little, it was like a yellow thing, like this big. And it had like a V in one side and I would just would have like pulled it through. And that probably didn't work really great. And after a couple of experiences with that, I just switched to the Avalon. Yeah. So, um, a couple things that a lot of people always hit on with those is, well, and one thing that you didn't say was like a lot of guys are like, oh, well, it's the lightest weight option. Right. It's like, well, it's actually not. By the time you throw six blades in there yeah. and all the packaging for it and stuff like that, um, you can get that same weight in an ultralight frame. Yeah. Like I'm running or other, other, other guys are making some really good ones too. Right. Um, I don't hold myself on a pedestal that I'm the only guy doing it. Um, but the other thing that I found, and it was actually why I quit using um, replaceable blade knives and, and developed the mountain series of blades was um, the the safety factor of them. Right. Uh, it was it was on that bowl that I shot. Well, that one in the camera there okay. that I shot solo, and I broke a I broke a, a Taito knife off, off like the blade of it. It's yep. nothing gets Taito. It's the blade. No, no, hundred um, percent broke the blade off inside of the hip joint. Yep. I'm solo on an elk by myself in a swamp. I'm holding the rear quarter up and it broke off down in that ball joint. And uh, I kind of gingerly felt around for it, couldn't find it, put a new blade on. And the first cut I put back in there, I caught that old blade and I sliced my finger wide open. And like, I still got a bad scar there. It sliced that index finger wide open. <sighs> I was like, kid, hey, there's got to be something a lot fucking safer than this. That's happened to me so, for sure. And I'll go one step further. Where are you putting those motherfuckers when you're done with them? Because they, exactly. I was like, I, I, I what, well, what I'm going to put it. If you're lucky enough to save the wrapping of the previous one, this is what I've found now is I got to put it back in the wrapping that the last one came out of. And then I can kind of mm -hmm. squeeze it flat and fold it and put it back in my kill kit to dispose at home. But I guarantee 99% of people are just driving those things into the, ground, into the ground, out in the field. And it's like, man, that's, you never know. You could even forget that you put it there. Like there, a lot mm -hmm. of really bad shit. That's the one know, thing guys. about disposables that trip me out is what to do with the, with the old ones. I know guys that would literally, they take it, they wouldn't wrap it or anything and they put it back in their kill kit and they're like, it'll be fine. And it's like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, um, anybody that is taking replaceable blades, the one thing that I did do, which I really like, is just a pill bottle, okay. a normal size pill bottle yep. that works really well. It's super se secure. You're not going to lose anything. Nothing's going to poke out of it. If you are going to go that direction and you don't have to carry all that packaging or worry about losing it. I or like that a lot, it. man. Or an old film container canister would work. I've got like a yeah. clear plastic thing that when I buy them in bulk, it like comes in one of those. And I just keep that in mm, my kill kit. Yeah. And then you can tell the old ones. Cause I've, cause I've already opened them and they're all dirty and shit. But. Definitely. So, so yeah, it was just a safety factor. Yeah. Um, they, those ultralight knives, they really are more lightweight cause you're not carrying a bunch of blades, but then also it's just the security of it. Like, like there's something about holding a full tang knife, whether it's ultralight or not, yeah. that it, it just, you feel some security being out in the bush with that. I don't care who you are. It's I'll carry like, I always carry one ultralight and then I carry like full tank custom, like a, like a real hunting knife. Yep. If I need to, uh, it's always running just on the shoulder strap of my, of my pack there. Um, oh, I like that. Yeah. It's a nice setup. What I have going. Yeah. yeah. Cause with the belt, the belt's a bit tricky, man. By the time you're wearing, and I wear a, a stretchy belt, I don't, and there'd be mm -hmm. nowhere to stick a knife. I guess you could put it on the hip pad through one of your things, but that's a great spot for it. Cause then it's also, yeah. are you carrying it like half down? Like, can you grab it like this and pull out? Yeah, definitely. So it, it's sitting just right up on my shoulder. So, um, uh, I, I have two different options. Like, uh, there's a scout carry, which is just a, a sewn in band that goes around that you can unclip your, uh load lifter off of yep. and just slide the buckle through or if you want to really secure like what i run is uh it's got a tech lock clip on the back which is something if somebody wants to order custom they can always just ask for this and it just opens up and you slide it in like um like it works good on my kafaru pack i've tested on like mystery ranch and stone glacier works too but you just slide it through one of the actual like pieces of webbing on the shoulder strap 
and then super secure there. So I can press into it or pull out and it's going to, uh, it's going to stay where it is and the handle's pointing down. So it's, uh, it's super nifty. I and really like just that option. Is, if I'm stopping for lunch or like at camp or like yeah. I'm going to make camp, then I just ha- take my pack off and then just quickly unclip that tech lock. And then you pop it onto your belt. You don't have to take your belt off. Don't have to take the pack straps off. Just that tech lock opens up wide, stick it on my belt. And then I've got my knife right there. See, I usually carry an EDC, but I did have it one time get pulled out by like a, a branch piece of salal mm-hmm. or something, and then just disappeared on me. And I, and I could never find it again. And so now I tend to bury it deeper in my gear, but, but it, or what I'll actually do is normally put it in my lunch bag. Like I carry one gallon bags for each lunch now in the morning, I'll just move it from the old one to the new one. But it is the pain in the ass that you're, you're not actually sitting down and you just have something like a piece of twine or something that you want to cut. You're kind of in this like, well, now I got to get in there and like dig it all out and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And, I, and that's one, that's one thing, unless you're running, like, like if you're running a leather sheath, there's not a lot of guys that make leather sheaths that'll actually hold it in there. Right. We have a, like, I actually came up with a patented process that, um, that I, I have all patent rights on and everything like that, but it is, it's a friction lock technology on our knives. So um, they're locked in there with set. It's about, they settle in at about seven pounds to pull them out. So um, our warranty actually covers lost knives because I feel that confident that you'll never lose one of our knives out of our seas. So, no shit. Um, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, man. It's, um, I, I See, and that's what you're talking it, about. Like, like a hunter first, like most guys, like most knife sheets are shit. Yeah. <laughs> most knives oh, yeah. come in. Do you know what I mean? Like you're looking at it. just like, man, yeah. somebody's going to die. Um, yeah. So, so it's that, always a second thought. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. And one of the questions that I was going to ask you, but you are actually already kind of answered it. I was going to say, you know, if you only had one knife, what would it be? But I think what you're really advocating here is for, and we can limit ourselves to like more remote style hunting. Cause let's admit it. If you're truck hunting, you can kind of have the kitchen sink with you and it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. But for guys where weight is a premium, am I correct in assuming that you would advocate like a, a lighter processing knife and then like a more heavy duty fixed blade, um, uh, more traditional hunting style knife for the rest of the knife related activities you're going to need to do while hunting. Exactly. Like it, anybody that's like, Oh, well, if you can take one knife and it's like, well, take two. Right. Like that's, it's my, it's, it's really my thing. Like it's, um, I, I'm a real hard person to convince on the ultralight side of stuff. I make ultralight knives. I, I see the point of them. I love them, everything like that. But Um, I have different issues with ultralight gear and, uh, I feel very strongly that, you know, take gear that you can rely on and it's not going to let you down in the field. And so, yeah, if you're going to take one knife, I think like if I did have to take one knife, it would be like a small caping knife, um, like that two and a half inch long blade. And then I would do something full tang where it's got, you know, the steels run all the way to the back of it. It's going to be really durable. Um, and yeah, I, those little, uh, those ultralight Lynx blades are Mountain Series, the caper on there. Um, it's called the Lynx and it's got a two and a half inch cutting edge on it. Okay. And I've done three, three elk with them now where it's just that it's just because I was through the testing process. I want to make sure that I could do it all with this one little caping knife. And I've, yeah, so I did three knives just in the, pro, in the testing period of, or three bull, bull elk off that testing period of that knife. And you can, you don't need as much knife as you think you do. Right. Um, these guys that fucking make these big six inch, six inch knives. Like, I don't know what you're killing out there, but I really don't think you need it. That's the one thing that the disposable did teach me. Um, also, it also teaches you to respect kind of the different edges. Like you, mm. you know, depending on where you're at with the animal, you can, you can go up for the tip and get more of that fine work and then come back to the more rounded curve for more of those kind of like big sweeping skinning mm-hmm. strokes. And I did think it, it taught me a bit more of an appreciation for that. And the fact that, yeah, you don't like, what are they inch and a half, two inches, something like that. You don't yeah. need a whole lot of edge. The other thing that I forgot to mention, the other thing that trips me out with those things is taking them off and putting them back on. God. I am so yeah. terrified. <laughs> like nowadays I use my Leatherman and even then if it's covered in blood and guts and you're just like, this is not good, man. And taking them off no. is the worst because you're applying so much pressure to that like thin little piece of surgical steel. And I, I don't know how mm-hmm. many times I've broken them and it's like 
somebody's going to take one of these things to the fucking eye or like, it's not good. And you're taking it off. It's bloody full of fat, yep. whatever it is. Yep. And they're just it's like, like lubed up. Oh. <laughs> like, I know. It's brutal. Oh. It's like, what's worst case scenario? It's like, well, I'll play with a sharp edge. Yeah. Uh, well, grease all over my hands. Right. Like. It's nuts, man. Okay. So where are you at with, with business growth? Are you at the point where, cause like as a business consultant, like I'm always curious about these, like what you do is not truly scalable because you're kind of limited. Like your own time is such an, an, an inherent part of this process. Are you at the point yet where kind of demand is, is outweighing supply? Do you ever want to get to that point? Like where, where are you at in the whole growth business cycle? Yeah, I, I haven't been able to, like, being honest, I haven't met demand for the last two years. Okay. Like, um, there's, uh, I, I'm lucky in this spot that I can I can sell knives faster than I can make them. Yeah. Um, and we are growing, we are growing as a business to the point now where uh, the, the whole idea of the semi-production line was I wanted a line where um, I can produce knives at a cheaper price point because they are they're in that 225 to 350 range, depending on yep. how what you're getting for a knife. Um, but something that is more on a mass production scale where I can keep quality in line, quality yep. where it needs. So the quality of a custom knife in the mass production scale. And that that's the only way it can actually be met is by hiring other other guys to learn this trade and learn how to do it. Um as for the custom side, that's going to always be on my hands completely. I, I just, I'm too much of a control freak to ever let that stuff go. So for the actual fully custom knives, that'll always be something that's on my own plate. Um, and then as for the mounted series, the Ridgeline blades, which we're going to launch this year, that's all stuff that um, we're going to be hiring guys starting uh, in February, actually. Great. So pretty soon here, we're going to start the hiring process. And we're going to start bringing people on to start producing at a faster rate. Do you notice there's like, um, is there cyclicality to your, to your ordering? Like, are there periods of the year when people are, you're getting more orders come in than other periods? No, I, I haven't noticed that at least. Like, I mean, it's, um, so it's just a pretty steady stream throughout the year. Yeah. I got guys that guys that are maybe um don't understand our process of custom knives we always get that rush like a month be- before christmas where it's like hey i need a blade oh, before christmas right and it's like well we're booking like a year and a half out so yeah. i can get you one in two christmases from now but um so there's always that kind of influx there but um for the ultralight since we do drop like do them in drops uh, there's not like, uh, I've kind of messed around. Oh yeah. I forgot you mentioned March that. And, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and we've been again, really lucky. Like uh, our last launch of uh Lynx blades, they sold out in like four or five minutes. That's the last badass, blades yeah. they sold out in like 10. So it's, it's really solid. I, I feel really lucky for that side. So I'm looking forward to bringing some new guys on board and teaching guys and like, I never had a job I really enjoyed aside right. from the military. Um, yeah. And I want to create like a good work environment to kind of bring back that old school mentality of like people that are enjoying what they do for work and they take pride yeah. in what they do. And yeah. um, we're going to, I really want to bring that back. So we did hire last year. Um, I, I should say that to, to launch our leather line and, and kind of develop it into what it is now. I hired a leather worker okay. um, that I was kind of working with on more of a contract basis. So I'd bring them in for artistic stuff. And um, I, I hired them last year to run our whole leather line. So um, we are just going to keep expanding that. So we're going to need a couple guys in that space and a couple guys on the knife space here. And we'll, we'll see where the ceiling is, but I haven't seen it yet. So that's badass. And how do people get on this list to find out about your drops? Um, so either on the website and we've got like an email notification list Okay. or, else, uh, so you can go through there or else just watch our social media. And then we, I always give people lots of heads up. I'm, I'm annoying on there if anything, but when it drops coming up, I let them know a couple weeks in advance. Okay. Yeah. So that's the best way for that stuff. And, and we're really looking to expand on that side this year. Like my custom knives, I'm actually slowing down my production of custom knives. I want to take on less projects and really give them more time, each yeah. one. 
Um, and we're going to ramp up on the production side for the mountain series. And then these Ridgeline blades, like I'd like to do 2000 of those blades this year. So, That's badass. um, yeah, the, I, I'm pretty, I like to be pretty scheduled in my business stuff. So, yeah. um, uh, I've got goals that I want to meet and, you know, I'm going to do what needs to happen to meet that, but definitely business growth. I want, I really want to see what happens in the next couple of years, but as it sits right now, we've grown exponentially. So it's been great. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I'm going to break out. I'm going to break out um, these questions that we got on IG. Just to s- kind of start to wind things down here and people get pissed if I forget to ask them. <laughs> um, uh, what's the worst you've ever cut yourself? And do you have any insight on knife safety? Like just tips or... Uh, he also asks for the best sharpening system, but I feel like mentioning that, that two face, uh, workbench or work safe one, you kind of already answered that, but, um, what's the worst you've ever cut yourself and any insights on knife safety? Uh, worst to cut myself, um, it'd probably be a tie. So either that title okay. that I snapped off in that elk or else, um, I was sharpening a kitchen knife once. And then uh, someone came into the shop and I had headphones on. I didn't notice. And I looked up. And right as I was kind of making a swipe on sharpening stones at the same time, and I sliced, uh, I sliced through the index, the the fingernail, and it went straight through the fingernail oh. and then into the bed under it. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Shit! Yeah, I didn't even notice. I looked up and I looked back down, and and the knife was stuck in that fingernail there. Oh. And just, yeah, that was a rough one. <laughs> um, so knife safety. Um, I, I think keep your I'm eyes big... on the knife for number one. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, have, have like, let's say you're using like a neck sheath or something like that. Take that knife and put it away when you're not using it. Okay. I, I see that all the time in the fields. Guys set that a knife with an edge up on a gut pile and, or they're rolling an animal over. They put it here, they lay it there. And next thing you know, they're like stumbling all over it. Also you'll see them cutting something. They're like got a fresh knife edge right beside them. And um, just being cognizant of where that knife edge is and, I like to say, like, treat treat that knife edge the same way you treat, like, the tip of your barrel of your rifle right. or, or anything like that. It's the same thing. It can be super dangerous. It can kill you out there. Like, it, it can slice you bad or ca- catch an artery or something like that. And um, j- just time using it. Like, like, like if the only time you're ever grabbing a knife is when you're out there butchering an animal, like, you're, go- you're going to be foreign and, and clunky in the way that you're handling it. Like I, I just really push people to use knives more in the kitchen or like everyday carry stuff and play around with them. And, and you'll just get the feel of a knife and you will be more safe if you're doing that. I like that. Um, why did you choose nitro V over something like S 35 V? Um, cause S 35 V is, <sighs> It's like the the fucking six five creed more where guys just like oh that's a cool thing and then everybody's using it. It's w- when you look at what the steel actually is. Um, Nitro V outperforms it in how it can how uh, how you can how easy it is to sharpen in the field in rust resistance and in um, and in um, edge retention. It doesn't beat it in hardness, but it makes up for it in other areas. It's just not a well as well known. Um, part of that also is you know it's a quarter the price of like s35 year s30b with and no real gain so i don't know why like i'll just have to reflect that cost to you guys i'm not making any more money i'll right. just have to reflect that cost to you guys um yeah like there's like i was saying before there's a couple super steels that like I, I've, I use them lots for like millet. Like if I'm setting knives, like our, our um, like JTF two boys or the Caesar boys that are in the military, if I'm sending them like combat blades, I'll use this. Uh, like uh, there's two, there's L max or M three ninety steel. You're talking like a, a normal knife. Let, let's say uh, like a knife that's going to be $25 of my material cost for nitro B is going to be about 200 in nitro B, or is going to be about 200 in like L max. Okay. So if the if the budget was infinite there's a lot better steels but on a production style um nitro v does everything you want it to do and more at way less of a cost it's just not as well known 
That makes tons of sense. Um, sharpening tactics for harder steel. So let's say you do the knife you have is is harder, and it's not one of these more sharpenable ones. What are some of the things that you can do? Um, you every single time you go to sharpen that knife, you have to recreate a burr. So you're gonna have to use like that diamond plate on that on that uh, work sharp pocket knife sharpener, or else you're gonna have to have stones at home like wet stones or something like that, where you can, you know, work it at a low grit system and build that burr back up and then take it all the way up to a higher grit again. Um, for guys that are having a hard time sharpening in the field, I really re recommend like just sharpen how you normally are, but then strop it on a piece of leather. So it's just taking it on a piece of leather and just doing those back strokes on the edge and doing it on both sides. You're not cutting into it. You're pulling away from the, and then working from the tip all the way to the back. And I think, most people will find that they, it's actually way easier to sharpen a knife than they think. They're just not finishing it. They're getting to 90% and then they're giving up on the last 10%. Right. You have to, you build that burr up, you have to take it off and it won't come off unless you strop that edge. Okay. So guys that are having a hard time sharpening their knives, just make sure you're stropping the end of the, at the, at the very last step. And I think you're going to find that you're, it's, you're doing a lot better job than you think you are. And this is for me, not IG. I meant to ask this and I forgot. Are you a fan of like these fixed angle uh, sharpening systems or do you prefer to do it by hand? You have to do it by hand. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel really strongly about that. Like, um, okay, let's say you're getting custom knife like my from myself. I like to sharpen all my knives right about that 22 and a half degree angle. Yeah. Well, I'm a human doing it by hand. So it might be 22 and a half. It might be 24, 24. It might be 25. It might be 20. Right. So right. Um, if you have that fixed angle, it's cutting, it's cutting in off those secondary edges and you're really remove, you're doing a lot more work than you have to on it. Okay. Um, the other thing is a lot of those times, those systems, they limit you on, on um, j just that natural feel of what a knife is. So, I mean, uh, what do I mean by that? Like if, um, okay, for an example, if I take a Benchmade knife that says that it's sharpened at 20 degree angle and I grab someone else's knife that says it's sharpened at 20 degree angle, there's going to be mass dif differences to both of them. And you're basically going to have to rework that whole knife to get it to this fixed angle that right. there really is no need to be like, well, I need to be exactly 25 degrees. It doesn't matter. Okay. Do you have a folder like an EDC? And if not, do you got any plans for one? I do have plans for one. Um, it's uh, it's not going to be for at least another year. Yeah. There, uh, I want I want to. I really feel strongly about creating products that are not on the market right now yeah. or are different. And as it sits right now, there's there's a lot of other dudes making folders that are good enough or even really yep. like fairly fairly nice. Um, I want to make, I want to make a folder that you can process a whole animal with like cool. comfortably process a whole animal with. And there's just not none of that on the market, but that's because it's really freaking hard to do. Yeah. I bet. That's so, cool, man. I'll keep my eyes open for that. Um, I'm kind of addressed on this. I'm just going to refresh. If you could only carry one knife in the field, which would it be? And you talked about that one with the two and a half inch blade. You just maybe want to walk through that again in case somebody missed it the first time. Yeah, so I probably take uh, like a smaller caping knife if it's like a custom full tang, uh, something in that two and a half inch, two and a half inch cutting edge. It doesn't really matter anything else. Just look at that cutting edge. That's what you need to focus on. Um, like our Lynx blade is an ultralight version of that, or you can look at you know like a fixed blade, like a custom knife that that that's that same size. Okay. What is the best hide to use for a knife sheath? Um. Cat, cow hide definitely okay. is um just that leather is you know it, it's really easy to get veg tan leather is super easy to use um i use everything from elephant to um elephant to wildebeest water buffalo and just regular bison um but cow hide is there's something about it same thing as a leather saddle like you don't see a lot of saddles made out of buffalo and there's right. a reason right yeah so yeah. I mean, man, cow leather is pretty versatile as far as that. Just like we're talking about with your nitro V, like you're always looking for material that's like a compromise between a bunch of things. And I think cow hide is able to do that. 
Recommended Definitely. sharpening kit for beginner. We already touched on the kind of pocket work sharp thing. I actually bought their like belt grinder and ended up chewing up one of my broadheads with it because it's like, you got to be careful with that shit, man. Like mm -hmm. it's only a little strip, but like you can eat a lot of blade really oh, yeah. fast. Do you recommend, do people need something like that at home or can you kind of do everything you want to do with that manual work sharp? Um, I think a person needs to look at if they're going to be hunting for the rest of their life or okay. if it's a hobby that they're going to only do, you know, one weekend here and there. Yeah. Because if you're going to be doing it the rest of your life, invest in an actual whetstone system. So go to a company like Nanohone is one. Okay. Um, that's who I use for mine. Spend the 350 bucks, get a whole system and learn how to use it. It's no different than sighting in your rifle. It's just another skill to learn to use. And you, you, uh, the average dude, you pay that once 350 bucks and you will sharpen all as every knife, your neighbor's knife, your mom's knife, your, you know, your, your lover's knife, all you want, and you're never going to wear them down. So okay. spend the investment. that was nano hone. A nano hone. Okay. Yeah. So they're, they're us made whetstones. They're super high quality. And yeah, I really recommend that to guys. I see a purchase in my near future. <laughs> uh, full flat grind or convex grind for a hunting knife full flat always so for um, a guy who doesn't know what the hell is the difference um i mean i guess i could extrapolate what it might be but maybe break it down for for people yeah so full flat you're taking basically um the primary bevels of the knife so the, the ground in parts they're coming all the way to the peak of the edge okay. you're creating a, a triangle of a it's symmetric uh, like yeah a symmetrical edge there Whereas convex, which is like a rounded nose, um, it's creating a stronger point, but it's a very, like you think about trying to sharpen a football, like the, the nose of a football, it's got that really bulbous side. So it's not going to stay sharp very long, Okay, um, but it's going to be super durable. So like axes or sometimes machetes, they'll, they'll make those out of that convex grind. Okay. Um, but just go full flat. It's very, way easier to sharpen. There's no, I don't care who you are. There's not a lot that you're doing. Um, like unless you're taking an ax and you're cutting into fucking nails and then, you know, a fence post and this yeah. and that, you, you don't need, you don't need a convex grind. Uh, last one, Kydex or leather sheath while hunting. I always use leather. I, I feel very strongly about that. I, I think Kydex is cheap Chinese garbage usually. Um, <laughs> it's uh, leather. Leather is a natural material, so it takes it takes the the moisture. If you have moisture on your knife and you put it in there, it's going to pull that moisture out of it. It's a natural material, so it breathes the same way merino wool does. Yeah. Um, it it's going to protect your knife better because. Guys think, oh, well, Kydex is super hard, so it's protecting your knife. Well, it's actually not because it's hard on both sides, so it's eating your knife on the inside when you're pushing it in and out. Right. Um, whereas leather is hard on the outside and then like a nice soft felt on the inside, so it's taking care of your knife. Um, that being said, that's that's for my shees where they're the friction lock, the, my, my friction lock technology that I kind of talked about. Um, yep. But if a dude is carrying isn't buying one of my knives and they want to carry their knife as like an EDC on the outside, then yeah, you're going to want to look at Kydex because then it actually is going to stay in the sheath, sheath half ass at least. Okay. Awesome. Um, is there anything else you want to, that was insane, dude. That, that was just like an, like a master class in, in <laughs> knife. And I'm sure we didn't even really scratch the surface for something you've kind of dedicated the last five, five years of your life to, but is there anything you want else we want to touch on? I'll make sure to like, drop store notes in the show and your Instagram handle and all that kind of stuff. But anything else you want to mention or throw out there before we log off? Um, no, not really. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm not doing anything that's, that's like changing the world with like what, how I'm making knives and everything like that. There's a lot of good knife makers out there. There's a lot of dudes that probably make better knives than I do because they've been doing it for 20, 30 years. Um, I just push strongly, especially in the day and age that we're living in now, N know who the hell you're supporting and what right. they support. And 
I, I just feel really strongly about that. We can fake so much shit on the internet now with, you know, everything from this with like podcast to social media to anything, like know who the hell you're idolizing and who you're getting your information from. And yeah, just support companies that are made here in North America and support the hunting industry, the outdoor industry, anything like that. I feel strongly about that. Awesome. Uh, really appreciate you making the time for everybody else. If you could take a moment to engage with the platform, go give Tanner a follow at Frontiersman's Gear. Um, you know, give a like or a share or a comment on the podcast. It's all greatly appreciated. And until next time, thanks for tuning in. Thanks again, Tanner. Thank you. Cheers, bro.